Well, Dr. Phillips, thank you very much for sure, taking my time pleasure. This great. interview. This is a follow-up to your uh, Grand Rounds, which you gave on the resources in cardiovascular disease and how the C-suite will allocate resources. Right, right. And so we are normally do this right after the interview. This is a couple of months since then. So there's been some interest and feedback as we, as cardiovascular clinicians, always thought that you know, the whole weight of the enterprise was in our back and we floated that. Now, one of the messages that came out from, from you was that maybe cardiovascular is not quite the profit maker that it has been in the past. Right. And other areas such as orthopedics and neuro are becoming equally, if not more important. So how, how do we reconcile this as cardiovascular physicians? Right. Um, well, I think so. It, it falls into two categories. Um, uh, the uh, cardiovascular world uh, has uh, shifted somewhat. Um, it has become shifted more, especially on the inpatient side, uh, towards a uh, more Medicare payer population. Uh, that uh, is not um, a lucrative uh, payer uh, compared to commercial payers. So. In that regard, on the inpatient side, cardiovascular has shifted more towards something which is uh, more expensive for a medical center. Uh, on the ambulatory side, um, cardiovascular services, uh, from the point of view of payment and how we're reimbursed, is still um, a profitable area. Um, but it, uh, from the position that probably five years ago or ten years ago even, uh, you're correct in that the uh, ability to recoup our expenses on the inpatient side of the cardiovascular business has deteriorated. Now, I understand that since you gave that lecture, yes. there's been a lot of interest around the country and that you've had several invitations to come and repeat that lecture or evolve that lecture. You want to you tell us a little bit about what those opportunities are and the message that you're going to carry sure. nationally? Sure. Um, so, you know, I'm... Um, uh, you know, at heart, um, an academician. Uh, um, at heart, um, someone who uh, wants to promote um, discovery and uh, and to enable uh, physicians, in particular, um, and also our patients who benefit from that from that, um, to be able to flourish. And uh, you know, I think the environment around healthcare you know, is dramatically changing. I will put in a plug for my book, um, America's Healthcare Transformation Strategies and Innovations, published by Rutgers University Press. Uh, and so we take into account there all the changes which are occurring across the, uh, our healthcare system, which are dramatic. So this is a long way around to get to your question, but I think it's important. You know, we, ha we, we need to put in context a few things. Number one, um, the healthcare business in the United States is a $3 trillion business. Uh, that puts us about the sixth largest economy in the world. Uh, so it, and, and it's the biggest business in the United States. Uh, it, it's only been really uh, recently, within the past probably 15, 20 years, that we've actually come to understand the impact of that and uh, to start to um, operate the healthcare uh, delivery as if it were really a business and bring to healthcare the um, business practices that we've learned across other industries uh, to make us uh, more efficient and to uh, enable us to get more value at it. So it's a kind of a, a worn phrase at this point, but um, when there's no margin, there's no mission. Uh, well, we'll put it this way. Well, that's, maybe that's, you, you, can't do your mission, you can't do your mission, you know, if you don't have margin. So, you know, I've always been really interested in, uh, because I've been interested in discovery and I'm really interested in promoting academics, well, how do we find ways to fund that? So that's one of the, that, you know, since early in my career, I've been working on that. And so my new perspective, now that I've been in the C-suite um, uh, for uh, four years, is um, try to get an understanding and teach people, you know, how do you align your uh, academic and professional interests with those interests and uh, priorities of the C-suite so that you can get what you want to be able to continue your academic career, to uh, advance it, and also to provide better patient care. So that's what I'm doing. So I'm going to UMass, which is my old haunt, um, 
in October to uh, give that talk and then to Mass General. And, um, you know, if anybody else listening to this want, wants to have me come, um, I'm excited about it because I, you know, like having the opportunity to uh, teach people and to share what I've learned. So, so let's go back to how did you get to where, where you were? Okay. Um, you were a practicing cardiologist and right. you're well, incredibly well known for hypertension. Right. But what made you make this transition? Were you always interested yes. in business aspects? Yeah, yeah, I've always, so um, uh, my parents um, had a business. They were really interested in education and actually in politics, um, but they had to find a way to make money and support our families and they were good at business. And uh, so uh, they ran um, a chain of stores uh, that um, they were, they had department stores, and they were the like the second discount in the United States. I mean, the the uh, people don't remember this, but there used to be only retail prices, and they were the second people to say, well, instead of selling something from a dollar, which was mo mainly what people sold it for, they sold it for sixty nine cents. So, uh, so I sold my first toy at the age of seven, <laughs> and and I always watched what they did. So I was really, and I learned pretty early from them that. You know, in order to uh, run a business, you actually have to be on the floor. You have to uh, see what people are doing. So I was always interested in that, but I think that, um, you know, because of my cultural background, they were more interested in me being, be, being a professional than in business, so it actually was never even a concept that I was going to go into business. Uh, but I think I always, but I always had that, I was always, you know, even in, uh, in college, I was on the food committee, and then when I got to... Um, uh, you know, to medical school, I was on various committees, and I, I was always interested in the operation side of things. And even in the PhD that I did, uh, so the PhD was in molecular biology, and you know, when I think back on it now, at a certain point, I had a decision to make whether I was going to like look at um, DNA repair, or what I really got interested in, though is um, I wanted something very practical because I was interested in occupational health and healthcare work, health of workers and carcinogenesis was then becoming a big, a big thing. So instead of like going the route of, um, of DNA repair and studying some enzyme, I was actually one of the first trans translational people. I said, okay, no, I, I know how to adversely affect the gene, and now so I'll develop an assay that um, can detect carcinogens, because if you can mutate the gene, then you know that you have a carcinogen. So I think I always, when I'm looking back now, I was always more on the translational side. I was always interested in the operation side, even as a, a basic uh, scientist. And then I got, engaged, I got really excited about cardiology when I was a resident, and so moved into that, and, um, and then became a clinical researcher. But I was, you know, even coming out of residency, um, and I got onto the food committee at Mount Sinai, that's what we called it then. Um, you know, and so I was on that, and I learned about, well, how do people think about patient satisfaction, and then I got on the space committee, and then I learned that um, it doesn't matter what anybody on the committee thinks, it's whatever the dean wants, <laughs> you know, so, um, and uh, so, the, you know, so I learned some things, and one of the things I did talk about in the talk, which I think is useful, is that why, why I do encourage people to get on committees early is that, um, well, you, you know, you learn about how an organization works, but then you also, you know, l you make small mistakes. So, you know, one of the things I talked about in the talk, which I think is useful, is that, you know, when I was on the, um, page of the food committee, uh, I said, and I, and I cringe when I say, remember this, but this was probably 30 years or 25 years ago, I remember saying, um, oh, it doesn't really matter what kind of food we serve people. Um, we're really here to provide care, and the care is so good that who cares what food we provide them? So I cringe when I think about that because I think, well, that wasn't really very patient-centric and it wasn't, um, you know, certainly wasn't modern thinking. But, you know, it didn't affect too many people and probably nobody listened to me anyway when I said it, so it didn't matter. You know, so, but, but I think it's important to learn those types of things that you can, um, you know, see how committees operate. So I think, it, I think it is part of, you know, I think one of the, I will tell you one of the disturbing things I do find now is that um, it's hard to get people interested in, just serving on something to be part of the community. But we really are a community, and I think that's one of the kinds of things you do is to serve on committees and do things, and that's part of the, what you do. So, um, you know, and then I got, I, I was always good at the money part. So when I started to do clinical research, I was always able to put money away, and I think that was noticed pretty early in the institution at Mount Sinai. So, um, you know, I got made, um, so Valentin Fuster made me head of finance for cardiology when I was pretty early on. 
Um, I, I also learned another thing, which was, um, so, so I decided that, um, you know, I started thinking about popularity. Um, uh, well, you know, I didn't look at it as a popularity contest, and I don't think you should when you're in these situations, um, but maybe it could literally be a little more politic than I initially was. So, I, so he gave me this job, and I said, okay, I'm going to take this really seriously, and I'm going to figure out, um, you know, really the way to make us more efficient. And so I, I looked at, I broke us down. I said, okay, as if we were to start the cardiology department from the bottom, from start, what would we need? So I got everybody's RVUs. I looked at every single thing that we did in terms of the amount of work we did, who was bringing in what kind of money. And, um, you know, I said to Valentin, I said, look, I'll have this ready for your month. And I went, and I probably didn't discuss it with him before I, you know, because I don't think he realized, like, how in-depth <laughs> you know, what I had done. And I came to the... Um, you know, uh, my first meeting where I was going to present as, as chair of finance and say what I was doing, and he said, Robert, what did you find out? What did you do? I said, um, well, uh, the good news, I think we'll, we can continue to be successful. Uh, the bad news is that what I've determined is we need to fire 25% of us. <laughs> 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 so, so um, you know, but, but that, you know, but I, it, it is, you know, it, I, I did learn maybe uh, the best way to say it, but, uh, but I have always been interested in the operation side and making things efficient and, you know, and then, uh, you know, so that, that we can have more money to do the stuff we want to do, you know, which is to do academics and figure out better ways to provide, you know, provide care. So, you know, so then I continually moved up and, you know, I wanted to be, um, you know, uh, Richard Gorlin had been my chair of medicine and Barry Kohler and, you know, I looked up to those people, um, you know, as chairs, and um, so it was something I wanted to be. So I went to Lenox Hill to be chair of medicine, and, and I learned a lot there on how, on hospital operations, and um, you know how you also work with other chairs, um, and how you uh, you know have to find a way not to just get what you want, but help other people get what they want. And then from there, I went to become. You know the uh, you know, fantastic opportunity at UMass, but I'll give you a chance to say it. I could keep going, but you know, <laughs> no, it's great. You're an easy interview. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so a Yankee comes to Houston. You know, when I was at Emory, they used to say Yankees are like hemorrhoids. When they come down, but they go back up. You can tolerate them when they come down, <laughs> but they stay down. They're real pain in the butt. But you seem to have mastered this very well. Yeah. And tell me about the transition from working in northern hospitals to coming down to a place like Houston. Right. Well. Um, you know, I was um, excited to come down here um, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one is uh, I had had the opportunity. Um, well, first of all, I went to school in Florida, so I went. So I was used to this kind of weather. That wasn't, you know, that wasn't an issue. Um, I d I always liked the space program. I'm really excited about space. Uh, I did uh, work um, for, on the Mars project for a brief period of time. I did not know that. Um, I was brief because um, the, the, the question that I was asked was, how are we going to get people, after they've been in space for such a long time, how are we going to get them from not being able to stand, you know, to, they, they won't be able to tolerate any gravity, you know. I, so I said to them, look, just land them on the moon. Don't let them out of the capsule for three days. Let them just get, you know, uh, acclimated, and then they'll be able to, you know, get up, and they'll be able to walk around. I said, but that's not your big problem. Your big problem is, is that they're going to kill each other on the, um, that six month um, uh, ride from Earth to the moon. So your cardiovascular issues aren't your problem. It's like psychological, so you better spend some time on that. So, um, so I worked on that. So I, you know, I liked Houston. And uh, you know, when I got the call from the recruiter to um, you know, have the opportunity to be the chief medical officer and head of the group, uh, I, I, you know, I thought, my God, this is fantastic. I mean, because you know, I'm a cardiologist, and Michael DeBakey, and um, uh, you know, was here, and uh, you know, there were wonderful people that was here, um, that were here. I mean, I'd, I'd been, uh, uh, Mike Winones, I'd been stealing his slides for you know, for <laughs> 25 years, and um, Bill Zogby and I were one of the first people to work on. Um, Echo uh, evaluation of, of what we then call uh, of diastolic function. You know, we then called it diastolic heart failure, and um, you know because I was the head of the heart and vascular center at UMass, um, and so and all of um, so vascular and cardiology and um, CT surgery were all, all reported up to me. I actually had a pretty good awareness of you know the whole national scene, so I was aware of the great work that you were doing as well. Um, so I was really excited to come here and. Uh, you know, I, so that was, you know, so I was excited about doing it. And it was also a job that I really wanted because it's, um, 
uh, t I wouldn't have taken a job if it was just chief medical mm -hmm. officer because that's a really influenced job. But this job was combined with also being head of the physician organization, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, if we go back to what I was, you know, which is um, a finance job. And, you know, the, and uh, what I have learned, uh, if you don't control the money, um, you know, your, your power is much, is diminished. So, so it was a great combination for me. Uh, so I was also really fortunate that um, I have a wonderful wife who's a great physician and great administrator, and um, she um, is from Georgia. So that I think, right. yeah, I so George, uh, she's okay. from Augusta. And so um, I've spent a lot of time in the South, and um, you know, any northern edge that I might have, um, she helps to um, uh, coach me on, um, so, uh, on, on softening. So that's wrong, right, you know, so. Well, she's that, done a great job. <laughs> she's done a great job. Right. So I think you've got the hardest job in the whole place at the moment, managing a whole slew of, how many are we up to, 700? 700 uh, physicians, yeah. It's, it's, yes, it is. It's a, uh, well, it's a wonderful, look, I, it's a wonderful job. Um, I, uh, I really do think I have the best job in academic medicine right now because of the combination, um, you know, being head of the group, uh, being uh, the chief medical officer, so having the opportunity to have that influence of implementing evidence-based medicine and being in charge of the, the clinical side of the EPIC implementation and, you know, helping to reduce variation and, and keep our standards up. And also now I'm the chief safety and quality officer, so it gives me that real big span. I mean, there's no... Um, there's no filter between me and other things that are going on. At the same time, there's nobody else to blame, mm. you know, when things don't go right. But it's really terrific. And also now that I have the um, the uh, outcomes research also reports up to me. So that whole span that we have about the, all the clinical activities across the whole organization. I, I don't think anybody else in academic medicine has this. Uh, it, it's really exciting, and I get to work with great people. So I, I never thought of. Healthcare as being the sixth or seventh largest economy in the world, and I'm always astounded that the rules change and can be changed at the drop of a hat in terms of how a third or a quarter, or, you know, of our revenue is going to be affected. It can yeah. happen, you know, every six months, and we have no idea. I mean, I don't even know how you start planning for the future mm -hmm. when you know a significant portion of a reimbursement we have no idea where it's going to come from. Right. Um, well, you know, I think that it's, um, I, I don't think you can have more than a three to four year plan. I think that's true. Uh, when I did come here, I was hope. so I came in 2013, I looked at 2017 and said, okay, I think I can think far ahead into 2017. And I think there's things that are going to be, you know, we can, we, we know what commercial payers are going to pay, kind of have a sense of where Medicare is going. Um, you know, I, I think we do have a sense we're going to be paid less. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, sure. yeah, I mean, very <laughs> short. We're going to be paid less. I mean, you know, and, 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 you know, and if you were looking at it from the point of view of, um, you know, what do you want to have as a society, I'd say... Having 20% of your GDP in healthcare is too much. You know, um, you know, we that w when you have so much of your GDP in healthcare, you you don't put the money into roads, you don't put money into bridges, you don't put money into education the way you need to do it. So I think that we have a responsibility as healthcare providers and those who understand it to say, okay, well, let's wh where are the things that we you know have uh, can get more efficient and uh, do things you know, still better, but not as expensively. Well, I was gonna to get to your book. I think you've already, you've already kind of touched on that a little bit. I think we're very proud of the fact that you've made the leap into the administrative side, but have continued to, to publish and think about you know, finances in an acad from an academic standpoint right. as a guy who's kind of been in the trenches. Right. And for us, having you represent us, I think is, is critically important and take that role up and another level nationally, I think mm -hmm. would, be, would be fantastic. Sounds like you're going to run for office at some point. Are you going to be <laughs> the secretary for uh, DHS at some point in time? You never know. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to say? Uh, yeah, I, I think this is a wonderful time in healthcare. Uh, you know, I, I, I am focusing a lot right now on, uh, well, I started a new committee here. Um, it's called uh, the Physician Experience and Resilience Task Force. 
and um, I, you know, there's, there's clearly an so enormous amount of change which is occurring. Uh, and, uh, and, some, and you know, I, I tend to be very, very optimistic, so I, I've got to say that um, I've got to reach down a little bit deep to try to understand why there's so much angst among people. I still think we're incredibly privileged what we do. Um, you know, we wake up in the morning and we're able to, you know, it, it's a lot of burden, but, you know, to, we, we really help people and we're thinking about things that are exciting and wonderful and, you know, how do you make cool new things happen and how do you take care of people who really need your help. So I think that's terrific. But I do, I, I do understand that, you know, the burdens that we have, administrative burdens, we need to reduce those. We need to make the electronic health record more um, uh, slicker and easier for people to utilize. Uh, you know, we've got to incorporate more things like predictive analytics that help us take some of our, um, you know, some of the drudgery away. But I also do think that if we make things, you know, if we do make things more streamlined, if we do reduce some variation, you know, we will free up some time to make ourselves more creative. So, you know, the, the mantra that I've been um, promoting within the safety and quality world is, that um, uh, the standardization as our default, but the, we invite variation and, div and individualization you know, when it improves care. That's very interesting. I, as you know, we run this meeting called Pumps and Pipes where we stand up in front of engineers. And I think we often take for granted the privilege of taking care of people on a daily basis. Right. And it's interesting when I stand up in front of a group of non-medical people and you explain a problem you can see these light bulbs going off in these engineers and it's very empowering when they realize that they have got a skill set that right. they can which they will will give to you right. to help a patient because they find that incredibly gratifying it's wonderful we get to do that on a daily basis and we sometimes take that too much for granted anyway thank you thank sure. you very much indeed My pleasure. appreciate <laughs> you Dr. Phillips for being here. thank you